well, I am quite bewildered in some ways uh, with regard to this book. Um, and in particular, the concepts of collective agency and collective subjects and collective persons and collective sovereigns that I think are addressed in the state by Philip Pettit with remarkable casualness in a way, like just blinking out all the various problems which are completely overwhelming. All right, uh, and again, I'm not even saying, I'm not, I'm not um, starting with the claim that collective agents are fictions or are false. They are in some sense fictional or constructed or something like that in a way that I feel like persons associated with individual human bodies are not, but that's not necessarily dispositive. It doesn't mean they're not real, for instance. Um, Okay, I mean, I don't think I necessarily have any choice or any other possibilities but to be the person I am. Uh, but I face incredible complexity when it comes to sorting out collective uh, agents in which I may be embedded. All kinds of shit, really, right? Institutions, nations, sometimes more than one, United Nations, I don't know, um, states counties, family, clubs, I don't know. Uh, but anyway, I think sorting these things out is, is really necessary. I guess I touched on this in previous bits. Uh, but let me try a couple stabs at this on the construction of collective agents and, and, that, and specifically the construction of the sovereign. I mean, the whole thing, Pettit, it's really an interesting book in some ways. Like Pettit boldly accepts absolutism. That is that the sovereign is an absolute authority. Okay. And he boldly accepts, uh, I mean, a Hobbesian conception of sovereignty. Um, that is as a collective agent, a body consisting of all our bodies, I guess. Or the polity. I mean, what, what this thing is, is actually really rather mysterious. Even though he seems like the first thing he needs to do is clarify these things, right? right. Um, what he really hits really, really hard over and over again. And what is amazing is there's no index entry for voice, okay? But what is the sovereign? It's a voice, a single univocal voice, which is completely redundant, but he says it over and over again. A univocal sovereign. The voice of the sovereign. Now look, that's a frigging metaphor, yes? Okay? And God, who is speaking to whom, how, is an incredibly uh, difficult question. And, and actually, it's embedded in all these fictions, man. It's a fictional discourse. There is no voice of the sovereign. And if there were, we'd need a big old roll of duct tape, bitch. All right. Well, I just lost some philosophers. I don't care no more. Ha 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 ha. Um, all right. Now we're on page 145 of the state. I'm working my way through it. Yeah, thank God he is going to endorse some kind of decentralized state or at least endorse the idea that that's compatible with the absolutism that he's articulated and the fictionalism about collective entities. All right. This is the bottom of 145. This is in chapter 3. As he's evaluating, well, I, I won't put this fully into context. Um, how should we understand the notion of acceptance in this context? Now, I'm going to understand, I think, that the acceptance of the sovereign voice is what constructs the collective sovereignty. The acceptance, acceptance is a necessary condition of collective sovereignty. I think he's saying that. 
acceptance is a really blank term, right? I, I mean, to, to lean this heavily on, actually. Because uh, it could mean anything from, oh, yeah, let's go, man, to, I guess I don't have any choice, do I? Uh, that is the kind of acceptance he's... Uh, he doesn't know that, Pettit. But that is the kind of acceptance he's going to get. Um, okay, how should we understand the notion of acceptance? Acceptance of a, of a sovereign by a citizenry. The natural line to take. The natural line to take. That's a typical argument in Pettit. The natural line to take is X. And that's the argument. Lord knows why. It doesn't seem natural to me. But it's the sovereign should be accepted. Should be accepted in the sense... Sure, why not? Uh, you, in which, by the argument of chapter one, the decision maker laws, decision maker laws needed for any legal system, together with the decision taker laws that they are used to support, may be expected to attract acceptance. May be expected to attract acceptance. Where? Why? Who? What? Yes and no. Maybe. Some of them yes, some of them no. Some polities yes, some polities no. Some voices yes, some voices no. I mean, this is, again, typical of Petty. just says, we can expect this. Oh, it should be like this. And so it is like this. It's sentence after sentence. It's just completely odd to think that it, he thinks he's mustering reasons. Many of those laws, okay, um, Many of those laws favor some citizens more than others and may not be endorsed enthusiastically in every quarter. Really? But still, they will gain acceptance on all sides. They will gain acceptance on all sides insofar as, they establish what the, insofar as the order they establish has an appealing feature. Okay, so I don't know where the speculation is come from, coming from, actually. They will gain acceptance on all sides if they have an appealing feature. No, I don't know. Maybe, maybe they will, maybe they won't. They might have unappealing features, too. Okay? Or the appealing feature may not uh, register with the, po- with the citizenry or something, you know? Or they might want something else, okay, even though they're wrong, etc. I don't know where this, where, where this line of argument is coming from or where it's going, of course. Say that, uh, say, that of enabling citizens to coordinate mutual expectations. You know, one of the ways to express the function of the state. He has 17 different ones, really. Um, and is not supported just on the basis of the fear of those in power. If the decision-maker laws of an established state are likely to be accepted in this way, are likely to be, I don't know, why, huh? Then the sovereign they put in place will be accepted in a corresponding sense. Where? How? Why? Really? Thus, the sovereign may be accepted on grounds that the regime has a generally attractive property. This is not the way politics works, man. This is not why I accept a regime or you accept a regime, because it has an attractive making property. I, I, okay. Um, that of coordinating their expectations of what they and others may do without let or hindrance, even when the acceptance is reluctant rather than enthusiastic. The role of that generally appealing property is in motivating their acceptance means that while citizens may be partially motivated to obey the law by fear of legal sanction, they will not obey it out of fear alone. They will not obey it out of fear alone. Well, who knows? I mean, uh, if they did, then the sovereign and state would rely merely on intimidation, and in that uh, extreme form would constitute a reign of terror. Okay. Now, here's a little argument I want to make. You can't tell why the citizens are accepting your regime. You, there is no sustainable factual answer to why the citizens are accepting your regime that features an overwhelming capacity for violence and to in turn anyone it wants for any reason it wants. You can't tell whether people are accepting that voluntarily or not. Or let's try this. In the face of overwhelming force, 
voluntary acceptance is impossible. Your acceptance is coerced and constrained, not by what's happening in your mind, but by the objective external circumstances of overwhelming military force in your face, okay? Right? You have no idea what that acceptance consists in. Uh, and I'll tell you what it usually consists in or what it often consists in, and you can't tell whether it does or not in this case, in any case, is please don't hurt me. Any regime will get that as long as they have a big enough capacity for violence. That is, as long as they still constitute a state. Now, doesn't that make you a little worried about the man, uh, how we're manufacturing collective agents here? Like, what is this thing? The state, the sovereign? It's all of us together, yes. Under circumstances in which some of us are massively coercing others, in which uh, the whole thing is structured by coercive force. Okay? So... Now, does that make any difference to what kind of agency we've produced? Right. Could we together form a collective agency if we're doing so under coercion? Of course not. Okay. Now, but actually, I don't know if we are together forming a collective agency or if this collective agency is a sheer abstraction. So let's try a little bit more um, to elucidate these concepts. Okay, this is on page 156. Um, Turning now to the polycentric polity, that is not, uh, not a single dictator, the sovereign bearer of political power, the bearer of political power, must operate in the same manner, and this is typical, again, typical Pettit formulation, must, the sovereign bearer of political uh, power must do this, must do that. Now, it, it can do whatever it can do contingently in this world, okay? Um, the utopianism is strange in the sense like it keeps, he keeps saying it's, it is real. But it's sheer utopianism, like he's making it up. I mean, I, I'm quite puzzled. Anyway, um, turning now to the polycentric polity. The sovereign bearer of political power must operate in the same manner by a voice that carries ultimate weight for decision makers and decision takers. But what is the voice that officials and citizens of that polity rely on? If we can identify the voice, we will be able to identify the speaker or the sovereign present in the voice. He talks about the voice that rules. The group, the voice is the group agent that is organized around the structure. In other words, the group agent, the voice, the group agent, is the polity itself. If the voice of a decision of decision maker and decision taker law, I have no idea what that decision maker decision taker shit is doing in every sentence. It doesn't help at all. Okay, it doesn't matter in almost any context here. Like what? Um, now I'm wondering about the editors, too. Like, <laughs> Princeton, jeez, man. Come on now. Um, maybe you shouldn't publish your own professors. Like, do you really hesitate to go like, dude, is that, could you clarify that, please? Um, then the sovereign in a polycentric state of this kind, in vi of the kind of vision, is nothing more or less than the policy itself. There is no difficulty in seeing how the polycentric polity can be a sovereign, given that, it, that incorporation, as we saw in the last chapter, will allow it to be an agent. And as it turns out, there's no difficulty in recognizing that it can satisfy the assumptions about sovereignty made in the sovereignist tradition. That is, it's the voice that commands. There is no difficulty in constructing that collective subject? It's infested with a thousand ideologies, man. It's a fiction created for certain people's purposes. Or let me put it this way. 
you can always prod on a collective subjectivity, supposed collective person, and go like, is there really such a thing? Whose purposes does it serve to invent or pretend that there's such a thing? All right. Who's being erased? Who's being absorbed? In every case, forging a collective subject is problematic in certain ways. Who's in, who's out. The, and in every case, there's internal power relations, power dynamics. This is probably true in, in, in you know, normal individual persons as well. Um, and you know, some of those are good, some of those are bad. Some of these things don't exist at all. That's certainly uh, one of the possibilities with this state. Like, there's no problem in just saying, like, oh, yeah, it's a collective subject. Yeah. Yeah. It's a voice. It's a voice. Really? It's a singular voice? And I think that voice thing shows you something. First of all, it's a metaphor taken over and over again as a bottom line conceptual category the voice of the state. And second of all, he really does, he's a worshiper man. He wants a booming, commandment-style voice to tell him who he is. He thinks we all want that. We need a voice. Well, it's a bunch of bullshit, dude. And it's, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's something that doesn't exist at all. The voice of the American government? The voice of the American government! The voice of the... No, it doesn't exist at all. And if it did, is it my voice? It's funny because if I heard it booming out of the sky right now, pet it, and I went like this, you know, like you go, oh, no, no, no. I'm going, that's my finger. And you're saying, no, no that, you, that's your voice or you're part of the chorus that's booming out at yourself from the sky. Anyway, this level of fiction, invention, narrative, making up gods and worshiping them, making up gods and worshiping them and saying, I'm not totally distinct from you, oh my God. I'm a little surprised to see it back in the political discourse. And you're probably picking up that I'm quite disgusted. Like, I don't understand it. This is loathsome. All right. All right. Well, anyway, okay. I would argue, though, like, I, I, you know, I could come up with a polite uh, persona for the APA, but I don't think that one's going to happen. So, peace be with you.